Lord be with thee, and prosper thou, and build the house of the Lord thy God, as he hath said of thee. This is David talking to his son Solomon. Only the Lord give thee wisdom and understanding, and give thee charge concerning Israel, that thou mayest keep the law of the Lord thy God. Because building the house without keeping the law won't do you any good. If you have a church but you don't have truth, you just have a community center. I'm going to say it again. I don't want anybody to miss it. If you got a church without truth, you just have a community center. Because the church in my Bible baptized exclusively and only in Jesus' name. If that hurts your feelings, it don't change the facts. Then shalt thou prosper if thou takest heed to fulfill the statutes and judgments which the Lord charged Moses with concerning Israel. Be strong and of good courage, dread not, nor be dismayed. Now behold, in my trouble I have prepared for the house of the Lord. David said, I have made preparations for the house of the Lord and hundred and a uh, hundred thousand talents of gold. I think that's uh, 4,000 uh, pounds of gold and a thousand thousand talents of silver and of brass and iron without weight for it is an abundance. Timber also and stone have I prepared and, and, and thou mayest add thereunto. Moreover, there are workmen with thee in abundance, hewers and workers of stone and timber and all manners of cunning men for every manner of work. David said, I've got all this lined up for you. Of the gold, the silver, the brass, the iron, there is no number. Arise therefore and be doing, and the Lord be with thee. Verse 17, David also commanded all the princes of Israel to help Solomon his son, saying, Is not the Lord your God with you, and hath he not given you rest on every side? For he hath given the inhabitants of the land into mine hand, and the Lord is subdued, and the land is subdued before the Lord and before his people. 19, so set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Arise therefore and build ye the sanctuary of the Lord to bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the holy vessels of God into the house that is to be built to the name of the Lord. Going now to 1 Kings chapter 5, 1 Kings chapter 5 verse 1. 1 Kings chapter 5 and verse 1, be reading through verse 12. And Haram king of Tyre, a foreign king, sent his servants unto Solomon, the new king, David's son, for he had heard that he had anointed him king in the room of his father David, for Haram was ever a lover of David. They were friends. And Solomon set, sent to Haram, saying, Thou knowest how that David my father could not build an house unto the name of the Lord his God, for the wars which were about him on every side, until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God hath given me rest on every side, so that there is neither adversary nor evil occurrent. And behold, I purpose to build an house unto the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spake unto David my father, saying, Thy son, whom I will set upon thy throne in thy room, he shall build an house unto my name. Verse 6, Now therefore command thou that they hew me cedar trees out of Lebanon, and my servants shall be with thy servant, and unto thee will I give hire for thy servants according to all that thou shalt appoint. For thou knowest that there is not among us any that can skill to hew timber like unto the Sidonians. And it came to pass when Haram heard the words of Solomon that he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be the Lord this day, which hath given unto David a wise son over this great people. And Haram sent unto Solomon, saying, I have considered the things which thou sentest to me for, and I will do all thy desire concerning timber of cedar and concerning timber of fir. Verse 9, My servants shall bring them down from Lebanon unto the sea, and I will convey them by sea in floats unto the place that thou shalt appoint me, and I will cause them to be discharged there, and thou shalt receive them, and thou shalt accomplish my desire in giving food for my household. So Haram gave Solomon cedar trees and fir trees according to all his desire. 
Verse 11, And Solomon gave Haram 20,000 measures of wheat for food to his household and 20 measures of pure oil. Thus gave Solomon to Haram year by year. Finally, verse 12, And the Lord gave Solomon wisdom and he, as he promised him. And there was peace between Haram and Solomon, and they too made a league together. <clears throat> Here we see Solomon building the temple of the Lord. And we're waiting right now for the last temple to be built in Jerusalem where the Antichrist will stand up and declare that he is the Christ. And that day is soon to come. The mark of the beast will be here and many things will happen. But what I do know is going to happen, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Nor his seed begging for bread. God's got a kitchen in heaven. He can feed everybody he needs to feed. Amen? And to be truly rich in these last days is to walk in truth. Buy the truth and sell it not. Because your kids are going to need this truth in the days ahead. Bill Gates probably left a... Not, is, who, who passed away? The guy uh, who did... Uh, I can't remember his name now. The gentleman who passed away who did the cell phones or something. can't remember his name. Steve, Steve Jobs left a huge uh, money for his children. But I'm here to proclaim to you, my father left me more riches than Steve Jobs had the ability to give. Because my dad left, he passed away last week, but he left me a heritage. And that is be faithful to the house of God. Know the word, love the word, live the word, do the word. Because then that only is true riches. Amen. Mom passed away nine months ago and dad last week. But they left me something, Brother Meeks, that makes me rich. Amen. They left me a desire to know God, to love God, Amen. to live for God. Amen. Like David left all kind of supplies for Sodom and his son. He said, Solomon, you're going to build a house for God. I want to build that house, but God's not going to let me, but he's going to let you build it. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start putting up resources for you. I'm going to start putting things away that you're going to be able to use in days to come. Mom and Dad put up resources in my life, resources of loving the truth, resources of loving the church, resources of loving ministry. The devil would love for you to hate ministry. No one's hurt me more in my life than ministry, but I still love ministry. Because my Bible said there's apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. That five-fold ministry in the Bible says God calls them gifts to us. They're not perfect, but God uses them to perfect us. Sometimes us being rubbed wrong is God trying to help us to grow up. If everybody's got to always do you right, you'll never grow up. You'll be a spoiled, rotten brat. But if everyone, you see, you don't know how, how much you love God till you get done wrong. Yeah. One man said it like this, being a Christian is not how much you love Jesus, but how much you love Judas. Can you get done wrong and still praise the Lord? Dad died on Thursday. I found him in the house dead. I drove back here and I was in church on Sunday to preach the word. You know why? Because if my dad had been alive, he'd have been in church that Sunday. Because when they opened the doors to go to church, Dad said the only hope my family has is the house of God. No other house is going to last, but the house of God will last forever. Your house, your house won't make it forever. But Jesus said up on this rock, I will build my house, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So for goodness sakes, get your house in his house. Because there's true riches in the house of God. There's stability in the house of God. There's peace in the house of God. There's love in the house of God. You know, this world will get you all messed up, get your thinking messed up, get your behaviors messed up. I keep coming back to the house of God so God can recorrect me. 
He can put me under that vice called his word and work me back into the right balance again. David loved the house of God. And David fought battles so that Solomon, his son, wouldn't have to fight them. Parents, if you want your kids to love the things of God and the house of God, you better be in the house of God. You better not be making excuses to miss the house of God. It ain't going to be enough to pray, God, save my kids, but let me do what I want. You may not like it, but it's the truth. David loved the house of God. David made as many mistakes, probably more mistakes than Saul. But there was a difference in David and King Saul. King Saul was the first king of Israel. David was the second king of Israel. King Saul had a son who should have reigned upon the throne. But God removed Saul from the throne, his lineage from the throne of Israel. And he put David on that throne. And David committed adultery. And David committed murder. Yet God gave David a promise, I will never take away the throne from your family. Amen. Why? Because David loved the house of of God. David said, better is one day in the house than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be in the house of God than anywhere else. Now the house of God, you're going to get corrected. You're going to get spanked. You're going to get set on the right path. But whom the Lord loveth, he chastiseth. As a father, the son in whom he delighteth. The Bible says every once in a while God will turn us over his proverbial hip and he will wear us out because he loves us. Amen. David loved the house of God. The ministry came to David and told him a story of a man who did a poor man wrong. And David said, that man needs to pay. And the preacher put his finger in David's face. David was sitting on the throne. He put his finger and he said, you're the man. Now David had the power and authority to say, off with your head. But you know what he did? He pulled off his royal robe, he hit his knees and said, oh God, have mercy on me. And you know what God did? He had mercy on him. David loved ministry. He loved the house of God. And David loved worshiping God. Most of the book of Psalms was penned by David on the backside of a hill with sheep while he talked about the greatness and the goodness of God. Now Saul, Saul never tried to bring back the ark that was lost because he didn't value the house of God or the things of the house of God. The first thing David did when he got to the throne, he said, we're going to get the ark of God and we're going to bring it back to the house of God. Because the first and most important priority in our life has got to be the house of God. Now God is an omnipresent spirit. You don't have to go to church to be where God is. Wherever you are, God is there. In him we live and move and have our being. But there's just something about people getting together to worship the Lord and preach the word of God. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Now that's impossible. Watch this. He's omnipresent. What that means is God said, if you'll get together as my body, as my church, I will manifest myself. I will show up in your presence. <laughs> Saul never tried to restore the ark, which showed how much he valued the house of God. We don't find Saul ever going to the house of God. Every time Saul needed God, he went to find the preacher to get what he wanted from God. And then we find Saul faking worship to God. The preacher said, you've done wrong. God's going to remove your lineage. And Saul said, turn with me before the people and let's, let's pretend to worship God. And the preacher said, I ain't going to worship with you. You scoundrel, you won't even hear the word of God. You're rebellious. Saul faked his worship. They both made mistakes. But if you can grab a hold of the house of God and the things of God, and if you learn how to lift the first thing you ought to do when you come to church is what the devil doesn't want you to do. Lift your hands to heaven. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, my neighbor's not doing it. Well, ask your neighbor. You plan on going to heaven or hell? For I, before I act like you, I want to know where you're going. Because when we get to heaven, it's going to be worship continually forevermore. Well, it's going to get good. Construction in ancient times was conducted on a whole different scale. The Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris took 182 years to complete. 182 years. That means whoever put in the first brick wasn't there when it was done. York Minister, a cathedral in England was 252 years in making. The rock city of Petra in Jordan was carved over 450 years. The Great Wall of China was completed over the course of approximately 2,000 years. It was not at all uncommon for hundreds, if not thousands of workers to give their lives to building something, knowing it would never be completed in their lifetime. We will consider the most significant construction project from the pages of Scripture today. While the actual building of the remarkably of it remarkably only consumed seven years to build that Solomon's temple. The process took much longer than seven years. It spanned two generations. Here's why. Why did it take so short? Because one generation made preparations for the next generation. My brother and my sister, hear me well. What you're doing for God now is going to affect your children. John said it like this, I have no greater joy than that my children walk in truth. What you do for God is going to affect your children. I've been working in hospitals for 28 years. One of the first things we do when you come in a hospital is we get a history. Did your daddy drink? Did your mama drink? Any cancer running in your family? How's diabetes going? We want to know because here's why. We understand those things pass on down. If it passes on down in the natural, it passes down in the spiritual. If you want your kids to have peace, you better get them in the house where the Prince of Peace is. You want to have a happy home and a happy marriage and a happy family, you better stay in the house of God. Because the worst day in the house of God is better than the best day out there. You can go read Ruth when you get home, the book of Ruth. The Bible says Ruth's husband, Elkaniah, he left Bethlehem. Bethlehem means the house of bread. That's what it means, the house of bread. It means a place where you can get provisions. He left the house of bread when there was a famine. He heard the foreign land had bread, so he took his family and he left the house of God. And years later, Naomi came back without her husband and without her two sons. And here's what she said to us today. She said, I left full, but I came back empty. All this world will do for you is rob you. You might have a good time, but you'll never really be satisfied. But there's satisfaction in Jesus. There's peace in the Holy Ghost. There's joy in the Holy Ghost. But you better take care of the things of God. You better make it easy for that next generation. Our elders passed us on a truth that we dare not let go of. The one God who is Jesus Christ. Our God is not a trinity. My God is not. He's not one person of three. My God is the only wise God. In Isaiah, my God looked around and said, I'm the only one here. There ain't nobody here but me. For the first 300 years of church history, every believer, every church, Every Christian church baptized only in Jesus' name. Then comes along the councils, church councils, and they begin to twist who God is, and they made him into three persons. He's not three persons. There's only one person in God, and that is the man Jesus Christ. 
And when Jesus looks at us and we say, Lord, show us the Father, he's going to say this, have I been so long time with you and you have not known me? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Jesus, Matthew recorded, Jesus said, baptized in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Ghost, right? But they didn't go do that. They went baptized only in Jesus' name. Because the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is Jesus. But the devil got in and messed up who God is. He tinkered with the definition of God. Definition matters. Everybody singing about Jesus ain't got the same Jesus. Hello? If we're talking about spiders and your, and your Webster's Dictionary says he got four legs and my Webster's Dictionary says he has ten, we're both wrong. We got to get a dictionary that tells us what he is. Right. 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 And when you know he is the Father in creation, he is the Son in redemption, he's the Holy Ghost in us in regeneration, but there's only one God. And his name is Jesus. But we got to take that and we got to store it up and we got to pass it on to the next generation. Say, listen, whatever you lose, if they take away your churches, if they take away your bank accounts, if they take away your cars, if they take away your job, if they take away your money, don't ever let them take away your Jesus. Buy the truth and sell it not. Praise the Lord. Praise. Woo, somebody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All me, whichever one you want to say. Woo. But this building was built in seven years because David got busy preparing for it. Solomon, it's called Solomon's Temple. It was only completed in that short time frame because of the investment of the previous generation. You're not wasting your time in the things of God. We used to go on vacation. My dad would cancel vacation if the pastor called revival. I remember when we used to have revivals. We'd have them four to five nights a week. And my mom, my dad worked at General Motors. And mom worked at AT and T. They worked, they worked in factories all their life, Brother Lee. But if we was having revival that night, they'd get up at three and four in the morning and they'd go to work. And when we got home from work, we went to a Christian school and they'd say, "Pack up your homework. Where are we going? We're going to church." Yeah. That's right. Amen. But we're tired, we're weary, we got things to do. Yeah, but we got eternity in front of us. Yes. We're going to live forever somewhere. Yeah. I like what Brother Anthony Mangan said. He said, I'd rather have a kid that made C's and D's doing the best he could. He wasn't good in this life, but he knew who Jesus was. He knew the plan of salvation. He got the Holy Ghost talking in tongues just like they did in my Bible. Yeah. I don't want no religion that's not in my Bible. I don't want no water baptism that's not in my Bible. Somebody said, well, you ain't got to be water baptized to be saved. I'd like verse on that, please. Because I got three right now in my head. My Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Amen. He didn't say he that believeth and is saved might get baptized. Yes, Come on. Peter said it like this, baptism doth also now save us. Yes. They've twisted that every which way they can. But he said it saves us. Right. Why? Because baptism is for the remission of sins. You mean to tell me you're going to get saved without your sins remitted? Wow, that's a great salvation. No, 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 no. Okay. Line upon line, it all works out. Just let the, but you got to take that and you got to store that up and lose whatever you got, but don't lose that. Don't let that go because that's for our children. That's for the revival God wants to give them. That's for what God wants to do in their life. We got to be investing in this truth. Every time you give the missions, you're investing in your children. Every time you support the kingdom of God, you're investing in your children. You're investing in the things of God, and God's going to take what's in your heart, and he's going to put it in their heart. That's my prayer every time I pray. I'm glad my kids are here, and they're still young enough to come to church. But every time I pray, I try to pray, God, God, put it in my children's heart. 
love for you. Give them a love for the truth. Come on. Because they're not going to be perfect. They're going to mess up. They're going to fall down. And God points his finger at me, Brother Lee, and he says, you better be in the house of God. You better be praying. You better be fasting. You better be giving. You better be serving. You better be doing. Remember, every time you ask God to do something, he's asking you to do something. He's not Santa Claus. He's Almighty God. He don't owe us anything. No worker is more important than another. The individual, the individual who drives the last nail is not more valuable than the one who drove the first. Had it not been for the former's commitment and contribution and faithfulness, the latter could never have enjoyed the ribbon cutting. It can be challenging to keep the big picture in mind. How what we are doing matters when we are mired down in the details of a particular task. Howard Goss pastored a church in this city years ago. He planted seeds in this city. He was the first general superintendent of the United Pentecostal Church International. And he come into this marvelous truth. Begin to baptize in Jesus' name. Receive the Holy Ghost talking in tongues. I still believe that. And if you don't, come see me. We can have a Bible study. Why would God choose tongues? Because it's one of those things you can laugh at and make fun of and discard. Or it's one of those things you look in your Bible and say, look, they did it. Right. Had a man one time tell me tongues is of the devil. This was a preacher. He said, speaking in tongues is of the devil. I said, really? Well, then tell me why all them people who wrote that New Testament spoke in tongues. New Testament must be, must be authored by a bunch of devils. Hello? The majority of our New Testament was written by the Apostle Paul who said, I'm glad I speak in tongues more than ye all. Amen. Say, well, I don't want a church like that. Well, you don't have to have a church like that. Right. But that's the way the Bible church looks. Amen. I don't know what you want, but I know what I want. But he planted seeds that are still going to come to pass. Anyone who has studied David's life seen the striking contrast between the best of David and the worst of David. But the difference in David and Saul was this. David knew how to worship God. He knew how to repent. You want to know how to repent? Go read Psalms 91. It's the greatest uh, chapter in the Bible on how to repent. He knew how to repent and he knew how to love the house of God. You know what the devil does? He, nobody backslides overnight. Nobody wakes up and says, I'm done with God. He just gives you a reason to miss church. You don't feel right. Your body hurts. You got a little ache. Got a little pain. Then have a good day. Car cuts you off. He just he just slowly pulls you. That's what he's doing with our whole world. He's slowly pulling this world into the abyss of hell. David committed gross sins. Yet he declared by scripture, he's declared by scripture to be a man after God's own heart. Because he had a deep desire to honor God. He wanted to build a house for God. He purposed to build something for the name of the Lord, which would stand long after he was gone. As David was nearing his death, he called Solomon, his son, to him and said, My son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house into the name of the Lord my God. And when David would travel to Shiloh, where that tent was, where that tabernacle was, to worship the Lord in that tent, he, that he traveled with Israel throughout the wilderness, his heart would smote him as, because he grieved, because he had a house, a permanent house, but God was in a tent. So he purposed to build God a house. And God said, I ain't never asked for a house, but you're wanting to do something for my name and for my glory. It began to consume him to build a house. Go to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Am I doing all right? I'm trying to keep you too long. 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 1. I'm going to read through verse 16 of 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 1. And it came to pass when the king sat in his house and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies. That the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, 
I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan the pre preacher said to the king, Go, do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. And it came to pass that in that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan the preacher, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me an house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time I, I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. And in all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me a house of cedar? God said, I ain't never asked for a permanent house. Now therefore so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, and from following the sheep to be a ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee, Whithersoever thou wentest, I have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in all the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. Keep going. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee. Woo! Wait a minute. David said, I want to honor you with the house, God. And God looked down and said, David, because you want to honor me, I'm going to honor you. There's a verse in that Bible, the Lord says, those who lightly esteem me, I will lightly esteem. Those who honor me, I will honor them. You better understand and realize God loves everybody. But love won't keep you out of hell. Because everybody in hell right now, God loved them. Here's what we got to get. We got to get beyond love to an idea that I want to honor the Lord. But you're never going to outgive God. When you honor the Lord, he will honor you. There's a verse in that Bible that says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he causeth even his enemies to be at peace with him. There's no greater life than living for God. David took care of God's house, and so God took care of David's house. You want God to take care of your house? Take care of his. You want God to be in your business? Get in his business. Hebrews 6, Hebrews 6, verse 10, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. And because David desired to honor God, God said, I'm going to honor you. Now, David wanted to give God a temporary house. God said, I'm going to do one better than that, David. I'm going to give you a perpetual. See, Saul lost the throne. David failed, his sons failed, his lineage failed, but they never lost the throne because through him could come Messiah who will reign upon the throne of David eternally. A permanent house. You're not going to outgive God. That's why the devil wants you to feel like, oh, the things of God are so hard. and so Because he knows if you start getting involved in things of God, God's going to turn around and say, you're going to bless me? I'm going to bless you. Mom and dad lived for God. They're married 61 years. Lived for God all those years. Every service, every prayer meeting. Up until the day of my dad's death, he was at men's prayer meeting every week. Don't think you're going to skip this kind of stuff and God's going to say, oh, it's all right. Nah, no. Treat me however you want. I'll still give you what? No. No. If we lightly esteem him, he'll lightly esteem us. That's what he said in his word. Amen. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth. That's what he's going to reap. Train up a child in the way he not could go, should go. And when he's old, he won't depart from it. Mom and dad raised us up in church under church pews. In a one God Jesus name, apostolic, holy living church. 
Now all their kids are in church. I don't think you can bring my dad back and say, would you like to have somebody else's money that had more than you? No, no, no. I want my kids saved. As much as I want to hear the Lord say, well done, thou good and faithful servant to me, more than that, I want to turn around and listen to him say it to my children. Amen. The Lord. The Lord. Noah built that ark for 120 years. He built that ark. Nobody built an ark but Noah. Noah was the one who knew the plan of God. He told his neighbors, build an ark. There's coming a flood. There's coming a flood. There's coming a flood. Build an ark. Here it is. To the saving of your house. 120 years. And you know what they did? They laughed at him. They mocked him. They made fun of him. When Noah started building that ark, he didn't even have kids. He goes home and tells his wife, God said, build an ark, there's coming a flood. A flood? We ain't never, what's that? What's the, what's the dictionary on that? We ain't never seen a flood. Rain? What's rain? I ain't never heard. God said, this stuff's going to fall down from heaven. We ain't never heard of that, Noah. How are we going to tell our neighbors to get ready for that? They ain't never heard of it. They're going to make fun of us. They're going to laugh at us. I don't care. God said, do it. Amen. Yeah. Now, listen to me. Can you imagine his children? Here's Noah with this big old thing out in the front yard. Half built boat. And they're making fun of his kids. Your daddy's a conspiracy theorist. He's a nut. Your family's a nut job. Y'all crazy. Until one day. One day. Somebody said, What? What was that? And somebody would go and say, What hit now? Go get the kids. Hurry. Why? We got to build a boat. Too late. So they run to the ark, Brother York. They run to the ark, and the Bible says, God, not Noah, God, shut the door. So they had to hold their babies while they drowned to death. Don't tell me God's playing games. He's serious. There's a way of escape, but we got to take his way. Amen. Somebody said, I wouldn't serve a God like that. Well, you mean a God to give you 120 years to get it right? Really? That's the word. Hebrews 6.10, here we go, Hebrews 6.10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which you have showed toward his name in that ye have ministered to the saints and do ministers in other words whatever you put into god you're going to get back god is never a debtor to anyone he never fails to observe any sacrifice made to his name and his kingdom he never fails to bless the one making the sacrifice if we can have tvs and internet and cell phones and cars and all this stuff but we can't give to missions our priorities are wrong don't worry it's not a prison it's a church but God will take care of those who take care of his he'll bless those who give to him though David was not allowed to complete all he wanted to do for God the Lord took note of his heart and his desire and he put that into his, Sol his son Solomon's heart the prophet Nathan declared also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house an heir to the throne of David would set up on that throne. Finally, it would be Jesus Christ. The principle is this. God always does more for us than we can do for him. First, it's hard for any of us to take a look at Calvary and then use the word sacrifice regarding anything we give or do for the Lord. You know what I love about Abraham? When Abraham took his son Isaac up to Mount Moriah to sacrifice him, Remember that? The Lord said, go, give me a sacrifice. I'm going to tell you the mountain. So Abraham, he doesn't tell his wife. Don't dare tell your wife. <laughs> he just said, we're going to go worship. Yeah. Come on, Isaac. Now, the Bible says, him, his son, and another servant go. It's my opinion the other servant is Eleazar, his servant. Come on, let's go. And they're going up there to worship. We're going to worship now. He does his wife. He's going to worship. God said go sacrifice. Here's the thing. What God called sacrifice 
Abraham called worship. Whatever God asks of me, it's not too much. It's just worship. Because the benefits of God's kingdom are unbelievable. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. David wanted to build a temple house. And God promised him an eternal house. God has made a similar promise to us. For we know this is first. Go to 2 Corinthians 5 and 1. I've got to hurry along first. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. 2 Corinthians 5 and 1. For we know that if our earthly house, that's the body you're in now, of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So God's making us the same contract. He said, give me your house, and I'll give you my house. That's why the Apostle Paul in Romans said, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, your house, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. What he's saying is, what do you mean? You're struggling giving up the temple for the eternal? This ain't even a hard decision. You can't keep that anyway. They're going to put it in the dirt pretty soon. Why don't you give it to God and get you an eternal tabernacle? Amen. When David decided, he said, But the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thou hast shed blood, and I, you can't build my house. So God uses his son. God, David's response was to this disappointment that he could not build it. He didn't say, well, I'm not going to do nothing, bless God. If I can't get the mic, if I can't speak, if I can't be the star of the show. Notice it's called Solomon's Temple. It's not called David's Temple. But David started the project, not Solomon. But David didn't say, well, bless God, if I can't have it on my calendar, on my time, and pride didn't well up in his heart and say, well, if I, it can't be mine, if it's not my idea, I'm not doing anything. I'm not going to be a part of it. No, he said, let me start, let me start getting resources. Let me start taking care of the things of God. Let me start taking care of the church because someday my children are going to be in a church in Malvern with a big old choir. They're going to have things I don't have. You know why? Because I'm going to keep working. I'm going to keep giving. I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep doing. I don't want my kids to have what I have. I want them to have better. I don't want their walk with God to be like mine. I want it to be better than mine. I don't want their love for truth to be like mine. I want it to be better than my love for truth. But rather than pout about what he could not do, David got busy doing what he could do. He started storing up stuff, getting stuff ready for the construction. I think he's dreaming about the construction God's going to use his son to do. And David commanded together, together the strangers that were in the land of Israel and to set masons and hew, hewers of stone, get them ready to build the house of God. They don't have a job yet, but he's already hiring them. He said, you're on way away till the project starts, but you're hired. And David prepared iron in abundance for, for the nails and for the doors and for the gates and for the joinings and brass in abundance without weight and cedar trees in abundance for, for the Zidonians. And they, they brought them from Tyre down and David stored them up. So David prepared abundantly before his death. He gets not to see it. It's a verse in that Bible that says, the prophets have longed to look at things that you have and they were not allowed. They could see it afar off, but they couldn't partake of it. Abraham went looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. He know he never found it, but he was looking for it. But we're getting closer and closer to one day that trumpet's going to sound, and we're going to find what Abraham was, if we had the faith of Abraham, which means we're still looking for it. Before his death, David was intentional about communicating his vision to his son Solomon. Then he called for Solomon, his son, and charged him to build a house for the Lord God 
of Israel. Communicating to the next generations those things that God has put in our hearts is so very, very important. I think as Ronald Reagan said, every generation is just one generation from losing freedom. So it is with the church. You better hear me. We're just one generation from losing the things of God. Because if we don't love it, we'll lose it. Because God will go find a whore or a prostitute or a drug addict or an alcoholic that will love it and he'll fill them with the Holy Ghost and he'll let them have it. God's not looking for our perfection. He's looking for our desire to want the things of God. When nobody else shows up to pray, you show up to pray. God takes note of it. No, the pastor may never mention it. You may never get an award for it, but God looks down and says, now I'm going to pass that on to your children. Communicating that next generation. Passing on the vision, baton of the great things of God. Each of us is charged by the word of God to be wise stewards, to go make disciples. That's our vision. Go make disciples. Solomon will be forever known as the one who constructed the first temple. It bears his name. We call it Solomon's temple. It happened under his leadership. We attach his name, but Solomon built it for the name of the Lord. It's not really Solomon's at all. It's God's. This is not my church. It's not your church. It's his church. That's why we're searching the scriptures to make sure we got his doctrine, not ours. Somebody said, well, I went to a church and they said a sinner's prayer and we're saved. Well, that, I don't find that in his word. Nope. Well, wait a minute, Pastor. In Romans, Paul said, confess the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart, and thou shalt be saved. Yeah, he's talking to a church that's been baptized in Jesus' name and received the Holy Ghost. Right. Well, how do you know? We'll read chap Romans chapter 1 and read Romans chapter 16, the first and the last chapter of Romans. He's talking to those who have already obeyed the doctrine of Jesus Amen. Christ. What he's telling them was continue in the things of God and you'll be saved. Well, there goes one saved, always saved. Paul took care of it all in Romans. Well, I went to the church. They don't worry about holiness. Well, the guy who owns heaven, God, he said, be thou holy, for I am holy. He said, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. I got news for you. I can't let you in heaven. No preacher can let you in heaven. So we better find out what the one who owns heaven. And then we better take that and store it up for our children and our children's children. Because they're going to experience revival we never experienced. But we got to be ready and preparing and praying and doing if you're not committed your children will probably not even be involved you gotta have purpose everybody say on purpose we have to live for God on purpose because you're not going to wake up tomorrow and your flesh is not going to straighten up Jesus said flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God you know why your flesh is cursed it's from this ground, this cursed ground. Your flesh can't be saved. That's why at the rapture you're going to get a new body. God will put his spirit in your flesh right now, but then your flesh and his spirit are going to argue from their own. And whichever one you feed the most is going to win. Let's stand.